seated. I invite you at this time to turn in your pew Bibles to page 1,900. 1,900, where we find our scripture reading tonight. In your bulletins, it's marked as 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 18 to 23, but I realized after I was working on the sermon that it makes more sense for it to be 18 through 25, so it's not Gail's fault. It's mine. <laughs> First John chapter 2, verse 18 to 25. So we're just going to read two more verses than is marked in the bulletin. So here now the reading of God's holy, precious, inerrant, infallible, and sufficient word. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming... Even now many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Recently, I was um, commenting on a passage, uh, a, a post that I saw. On, uh, on Facebook about preaching. And uh, it was something that uh, drew me in because obviously it's something I do on a regular basis. And, um, and it was essentially um, a criticism of a lot of preachers today and the type of preaching that they do. And... Uh, one of uh, the questions on this post, this Facebook post, was what are some books that you recommend for people who need to get better at preaching? And uh, Reverend Fettis is somebody that I respect dearly, uh, listed a number of books, and, uh, and he said a lot of preaching that he sees today he finds fault with because um, they try to do this sort of cookie-cutter model of preaching. And he suggested this is what you need to do if you want to be a good preacher, and and I kind of quipped back at him, um, in order to be a good preacher, you have to have um, sincerity. You have to really believe what it is that you're communicating. And, uh, and the people who are listening to you have to sense that you really believe what you're communicating about. And I was like, yeah, that's a good, I think that was a good statement to make. And then Reverend Fettis, he, he, uh, he, he mentioned back to me, essentially, sincerity doesn't make something true. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You can't just sincerely mean something unless preaching aligns with the, ex the extra category that I had left out is you must sincerely believe what it is that you're preaching, but what you're preaching must align with what the Bible says, right? It must actually be true. Sincerity doesn't make something true. It makes no difference what you believe, just as long as you're sincere, right? That's the philosophy of many people today, but it's not what the Bible teaches. Sincerity doesn't necessarily make something true. Well, it's my truth. It's my truth. I believe it, and therefore it makes it true. 
And not only does it make it true for me, but now my truth is imposed upon you. You must say what it is that I believe to be true. Suppose I feel sick in the night and I go to the medicine cabinet to get some stomach medicine. And I'm not fully alert. And in the darkness of the night, I get a bottle that I think is Pepto-Bismol. But instead, it's boric acid. And I become violently ill and I almost die. I was sincere, but the medicine was wrong. My belief that it was Pepto-Bismol didn't make it Pepto-Bismol. In the same way, it makes a difference what I believe about Christ. I can't just believe in any Christ. I have to believe in the true Christ, the real Christ. And that's why tonight, again, as we go into our study of 1 John, we encounter, once again, John's warning against Antichrist. John's warning, continued warning against these false teachers. And if there's one thing that I could leave you with tonight that might give you a sense of comfort as we enter into these, this passage that seems quite shocking, seems quite um, end-of-the-world kind of stuff, right? And it's, and it's talking about true apostasy that's happening in these churches that John is writing to. Um, something that could give you confidence is this. Something that Jesus himself said. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And hopefully as we go through this passage tonight, you'll see why it is that I wanted to uh, make this clear for us. So we have two points tonight. The first is danger. Will Robinson? No, not that. Danger, deception ahead. Danger, deception ahead. And the second point is knowing the truth. So danger, deception ahead is verses 18 and 19. Now once again, I'm borrowing with the outline from the very helpful uh, Bible study that Steve Lawson is doing through the book of 1 John. But I'll have to tell you that this week, um, I had to go my own way a little bit because I disagreed with him on how he was interpreting these passages on the Antichrist. So we'll get into it, though. So, first point here, the danger. Verse 18, John goes, Dear children, it is the last hour. So dear children, once again, is that term of endearment. It's a term of care, consideration. John very much sees himself as the spiritual father to these churches that he's writing to. And he's concerned that they stay on the path that leads to, to life. That stay on the path that leads to uh, eternal life. The eternal life that they have received already. John wants to see that they stay on that path. Um, but when he says, it is the last hour, this is the last hour. What John is talking about here is the period between the first and second coming of Christ. That last season of redemptive history. So the last hour is where we're at right now. It's the same uh, first coming, right? Second. It's this part right here. And what often you'll find is that the biblical writers will smush that time down into what sounds like a very small period, the last hour, uh, the end of all ages. Um, this is what the biblical authors are saying because what they're saying is, in, a, in accordance with redemptive history, there are no more big redemptive events to occur between Christ's first coming and his second coming. There's nothing ahead of us except for that. And so there's a sense of eminence about that approaching. And then John says, 
as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. So he makes this distinction between Antichrist and Antichrists. And i got to admit to you, this is one of the most challenging Scripture passages in the Bible because so much is put into this. This is something, John is saying, that has been part of the content of the teaching that they have already received. He says, as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Antichrist means in place of Christ. It's a Christ Replacement. It means in opposition to Christ. It also means opposite of. So it's a person who seeks to replace Christ. A person who is against the kingdom of God and who supports and pushes the exact opposite values and beliefs as Christ. And it's a person who wants to put themselves in the place of Christ. The question is, is this a, a world political figure? This Antichrist, right? He says, as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming... Even now there are antichrists among you. So it seems to be like he's saying there is this character who is capital A antichrist, and then there are these lowercase a antichrists. Is that what John is saying here? Um, and so what some people will do is they'll take this term antichrist, and they'll turn him into this political world figure, and they'll shove this term antichrist, into the man of lawlessness that Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians. And they'll take this word antichrist and they will put it into the beast of Revelation and the book of Revelation. They'll take this antichrist and they'll say this is someone off in our future. This is a big political leader who's going to uh, be like a replacement Christ. Uh, this is a, so this is what they'll do. And, and actually when I was... Uh, Watching Steve Lawson's Bible study, that's what he does. He ties all these things together and he says, this is who the Antichrist is. This big political figure at the end of history who's going to be like um, uh, somebody who's going to deceive lots of people. And so he takes a futurist approach of the book of Revelation. He takes a futurist approach of this main character, the Antichrist. And it would be something like, what the, 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 the big, famous, popular, left-behind book series did with the Antichrist. Nikolai, right? That was that guy who was this Antichrist figure, this political leader. But there's actually a theological definition of an Antichrist. The word Antichrist only happens four times in the Bible, and it's in the letters of 1 John three times. And in the letter of 2 John, once. This is what John says about Antichrist. This phrase, Antichrist. Verse 22 of our same chapter, he says, Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. So if you want a theological definition of Antichrist, it is the person who denies that Jesus is the Messiah. And he denies the Father and the Son. 1 John 4, 3, the phrase is used again. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So the, the, the one that does not acknowledge Jesus uh, is from God. Um, and then also 2 John 3, or 2 John 7. 2 John 7, this is what it says. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. So the pre-incarnate Son who came in the flesh as the Son of God have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and of the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is a deceiver. Someone who denies that Christ has come in the flesh. And there are many of them, not just one, right? This is what the Scripture tells us. Uh, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. There are many, not just one, and that many existed at the time of John. So, that's what we know just from the biblical evidence. Is that sufficient 
enough for us to be able to plug it into the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians? Is that sufficient enough for us to say, this is the same person as the beast in the, in the book of Revelation? I don't believe so. And I think we should be careful to do that. So this is what John then goes on to say. This is how we know it is the last hour. How do we know that we are in this period between the first and second coming? How do we know that we are in the last age, right? Um, we know that because there are antichrists out who are going out and denying that Jesus is the Christ, denying that Jesus has come from God, denying that Jesus came in the flesh. So after defining what or who an antichrist is, and showing that the presence of these antichrists are found among them, uh, John points to this as the evidence that they are living in the last days. So these antichrists are religious figures, not political figures. So uh, one of one of my um, one of the one of the guys that uh, I appreciate a lot, Doug Wilson, he says wh that when you read the scriptures, you'll find out that the antichrist um, is not somebody like Putin. Or in the past, people have said Obama was the Antichrist. Or Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist because his initials were 666. The letters of his initials, his three names, were 666. So you have all these political figures that you look at and say, oh, Mussolini, he's the Antichrist, right? Or, oh, you know, so you're, you're trying to read the Bible in line with the newspaper, with the, the, the television, the news at night, right? Rather than saying, what does the Bible actually say? Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to create this big, powerful political figure who's going to do all this world domination stuff that's going to usher in the end days uh, if you have this futuristic approach of the, of the book of Revelation. But what uh, Doug Wilson says is that that's what people think the Antichrist is, but the Antichrist is more like a liberal Methodist bishop who doesn't believe in, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying, because that's what John is saying. John is saying that the, the Antichrist is a religious figure. It's someone who's a false teacher, a false prophet, someone who's in the church. But the teaching that they give in the church is contrary to the truth. It's contrary to the gospel. They have a sincere belief about who Jesus is, but that sincere belief is wrong. It's wrong. False teachers who come into the church and are seeking to deceive true believers. These are the Gnostics that John has been com combating with his whole letter. Could there be one final figure called the Antichrist? Listen, I'm not ruling that out. Th that could be. But we have to be careful to, to put this term into other contexts, like the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians, or the beast in the book of Revelation, or even the prince to come in the book of Daniel. And I think the strongest argument for this, though, is, is that passage in 2 Thessalonians. But more likely, John is dealing with a historical figure of his time. And if you go during John's time, you'll find that there was one prominent Gnostic teacher called Serenthus. And if we understand the Antichrist to be Serenthus, then his followers were the Antichrists who had gone amongst John's churches that he's writing to. And the spirit of the Antichrist would be the teaching of Serenthus, who was beginning to say that Jesus only appeared to be in the flesh, but he wasn't because anything that is physical, anything that's fleshly, is, uh, is bad, and only the spiritual is good. And these followers of Gnostic teaching have now popped up in the church and are spreading this false teaching. And so this is what John is combating. This is the actual historical context of his letter. And then verse 19 gives us a little bit more uh, explanation about this, the defection. In verse 19, he says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. They left the church, John says. They defected from the church. They gave up their membership. And their departure shows the truth of who they are. They do not belong to us. They're not true believers. Because true believers belong to the church where sound doctrine is held and kept and protected. And false teachers cannot ultimately abide within a true church. They may come in the midst of a true church. And they may use the true church in order to stir and steer people who are in that church away from that church. 
and to begin their own cult, their own church. But they can't ultimately abide. And this is what John says. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going out showed that none of them belonged to us. If they had belonged, they would have continued in the fellowship. But they cannot abide because they have a different spirit. They have a different gospel. They have a different Jesus. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 talks about this as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says this. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That's what these people have done. They came out of the church to show the evidence of who they really were. They weren't really of us. They didn't really belong to us. It's that whole thing about the wheat and the tares, right? Sometimes we don't know until the end of time who the wheat were and who the tares were, who the sheep were and who the goats were. But sometimes, John says, false gospel teachers can come in amongst you and what they'll do is they'll lead people astray and they'll leave the assembly. They'll leave the congregation. And when they do that, they show their true colors. You see them for who they truly are. They did not really belong to us. And even though these are frightening passages about the reality of false teachers and those who are false professors, we can be comforted with the truth of God's promise that those who are saved cannot ultimately lose their salvation. Um, and this is something that Steve said, and I liked it. He said, the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. Say that five times fast. The faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. So if you have been redeemed by God, you will persevere in your walk. And you don't use that as an excuse. That is a motivator for true Christians. And we also have to keep in mind the reality of the wheat and the tares, the visible and the invisible church, the elect and those who belong to the church. So these false teachers, these Gnostics, who are following after Serenthus, a historical figure of John's time. Um, uh, there's even a story uh, in church history where John was uh, at this place and he found out that Serenthus was in the bathhouse. And at that time, you would always, you'd have these public bathhouses. That's how you went and washed and cleaned in, in the Roman Empire. And he heard that Serenthus was in the bathhouse and he said, let's flee from this place. I cannot even wash clean in this place that Serenthus is because of his uh, filthiness, his teaching, his false gospel. So that's uh, point number one. Let's do number two here. Knowing the truth. All right, verse 21 through 25. The first point here is the discernment. Verse 20 and 21. And John then says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. So here's these false teachers, these antichrists, these people who have left the church. How does John comfort the Christians in the midst of this? They just went through a church split. They just had a bunch of people get up and leave, and they're wondering if these people left the church because they weren't really true Christians, then how do I know I am, right? How do I know I'm not like them? And this is what he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. You know all things. You true believers have the Holy Spirit, the Holy One, which enlightens your mind to the truth of God's Word. You have the mind of Christ, the ability to discern and understand spiritual things. The Spirit of God has revealed to you the things of God. You have this anointing which distinguishes you from those false teachers which have left the fellowship. And, and Jesus in John's gospel said, I am sending you the Spirit. He's the one that's going to lead you into the truth. He's the one that's going to take what I have taught you and put it inside of you. He's going to continue to lead you in the things that are true. So when you're taught by God, you cannot ultimately fall for the deception 
of damnable false teaching. You need light and sight, and the Spirit gives that to you. It gives you light, enlightens you, and it gives you spiritual sight so that you can see the truth. And so John says, you don't have to worry. You have the Holy Spirit which enlightens you, which leads you into the truth. And in verse 21, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. He's talking about the truth concerning Jesus Christ and his gospel. None of us knows everything, but there is a body of essential truth that you must affirm in order to be a Christian. And John is talking about these Apostles' Creed, mere Christianity details. How can you know what is false teaching but is not damnable heresy? How do you make that distinction, right? Um, John is talking about the faith once for all delivered to the saints, the pattern of sound words, the essential truths that mark you out as a Christian, that you have to know and believe wholeheartedly these elements, that Jesus came as the God-man, that he lived a perfect life, he died an undeserved death on the cross for our sins, that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father, that he was raised on the third day, that he ascended to sit at the right hand of God, that he will come again to judge the living and the dead, that believing in this Christ gives you eternal life, not because of your work, but by faith in the one who worked on your behalf, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, but there are not three gods, but one God and three persons. These are these core essential truths, right? And you have to believe these things. You have to um, profess these things. You have to confess these things in order to be a true Christian. But you can err in other ways. None of us have perfect theology. None of us have perfect doctrine. And even if we feel like we do have perfect theology or perfect doctrine, none of us are perfect at applying that. And so these are these core apostles' creed essentials of the faith. The faith delivered. The apostolic teaching. The, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And John is saying that these are the things that you do know. You know the truth. Um, and because you do know it, you, 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 you hold on to it because no lie comes from the truth. But because you do know it because no lie comes from the truth... John writes to them not to lay this foundation again of these core essentials. He's saying, I'm not writing to you to, to, to clear out these core essentials. You know that already. John writes to them that they may continue to hold on to those essentials and not fall for these Gnostic lies, these false teachings. John is talking about heretics here, those who deny the essentials of the faith. And then here we have the denial. Verse 22 and 23. This is the, the opposite side of what John is talking about in verse 20 and 21. He's saying, you have the Holy One. You have an anointing from the Holy Spirit. But these other people, they have a different kind of anointing. Who is the liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, since his false teachers are so dangerous and to believe in their teaching is not a secondary issue, but a matter of eternal life or eternal condemnation. How can we identify them? That's what John wants to make very clear. That if you believe what these false teachers are teaching, you're not just in error. You are damned. That's what he's saying. So we have to be able to identify that. We have to have a clear marker about that. John tells us here that the liar and deceiver is the one who attacks the person and work of Christ. You cannot put your faith in any Christ. No matter how sincere that is, you have to put your faith in the true Christ, the only Christ. You can't preach about anything as long as you're sincere about it. You have to preach what's in accordance with God's revelation. And if you notice false teachers and you notice heretical cults, you will always find at the core and center of their teaching is a diminishing of who Christ is, of what he's done, the person and work of Christ. 
you will find a diminishing of the person and work of Christ, and you will find a glorification of the cult leader to the position and the glory and station of Christ. What does John say of this person that denies that Jesus is the Christ? Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. So a further definition of an Antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is the Anointed One, the Messiah. And because they deny that the one who came in the flesh is the eternal Son of God, then they also deny the Father and the Son. You undermine the only way Christ could purchase our salvation on the cross if you undermine the divinity of Christ. Not only that, but when Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, what he's saying is, the Father has made belief in my name the only way to have salvation. So people ask the question, what about Jews? They believe in the God of the Old Testament. Are they saved? Not if they don't believe in Jesus. Not if they don't believe in Jesus. What about Muslims? They believe that Jesus was a prophet, and they believe in the God of the Old Testament. Not if they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who died on the cross for their sins. If they don't believe in that Jesus, they don't believe in any Jesus. They believe in a false Jesus. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? They believe in Jesus. They believe in Jesus who wasn't God. They don't believe in Jesus. Mormons, they believe in Jesus. They believe in a Jesus who was Satan's brother who was birthed by God with his mother God in a world and a planet far away. Does that sound like the Jesus we believe in? They don't believe in Jesus. And these Gnostic teachers, they were saying, we believe in Jesus too, but they believed in a spirit Jesus who only appeared to die on a cross, who only appeared to have a physical body. But he couldn't have had a physical body because the physical body is gross, it's evil, it's corrupt. Only what is spiritual is good. And so Jesus was a ghost. He was a phantom. Is that the real Jesus? No. So they don't believe in Jesus. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Verse 23. This is emphatic. The one who denies the Son has the Father. The one who denies the Son does not have the Father. They're not worshiping God properly. They are not even worshiping the same God. You cannot claim to have the Father if you do not accept the Son as Jesus Christ, the incarnate, the Messiah. You have to worship God in spirit and in truth. And in uh, John Owen's writings, he'll say that when, when Jesus said that, he was saying, you have to worship God the Father via the Holy Spirit through the person and work who is the truth, Jesus Christ. Trinitarian worship is only true worship. And whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. This is the opposite. If you do accept the Son as he has been revealed, both the divinity and humanity in one person, Jesus, if you acknowledge the Son, you have the Father also. The only proper and accepted worship of the Father is in and through Christ the Son. If you confess Christ before men, Christ will confess you before the Father. And this is something that Paul will say in his letter to the Galatians. He'll say, if anybody comes to you, and even if an angel comes to you and preaches to you a gospel different than the gospel that we preached to you at first, even if I come to you again and preach to you a different gospel, than the, pre the gospel I preached to you at first. Let him be damned. Let him be cursed. Anathema. Let him be cut off from God forever. 
This is how important it is that we get the gospel right. This is how important it is that we get the person and work of Christ right. To not get the person and work of Christ right is to be an antichrist. Mormons are antichrists. Jehovah's Witnesses are antichrists. Muslims are antichrists. Realize that, right? Anybody who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, anybody who denies that Jesus is the Son incarnate who came in the flesh, anybody, they are an antichrist. And finally, the dedication. John leaves them with this last encouragement. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. Keep steady. Hold the anchor. Don't be blown this way and that way. Hold on to what you've received. Don't be looking for new and exciting revelations, but rather cling to the old, old story, to the passed down historical beliefs to the so-called boring essentials of the faith. Hold to those. Have you, ever, have you ever been coaching somebody in basketball and all they want to do are those cool behind-the-back tricks and over-the-head shots and, and you're just saying, go back to the essentials. Learn how to dribble. Learn how to lay up. Oh, that's so boring. I don't want to do that. That's what so many of us are like. We have these itching ears and we want to hear all these interesting new insights and, and John is saying, stick to the basics. Stick to the basics, to the essentials of the faith. Cling to those, those passed down historical beliefs. Can you trace the, what, what you believe back to the 19th century in, in America? That's as far as you can trace it back? Then what you're believing is a novelty. It's not apostolic. See to it that those essentials aren't lost, that they don't lack importance, that they are not neglected. That's why it's such a great thing that we, we confess the Apostles' Creed every, every Sunday. Or the Nicene Creed sometimes. Those are those essentials, right? John says, if it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. If God keeps you in the faith, if you hold on to the faith... Once for all, deliver to the saints the pattern of sound words, the core essentials of the gospel, and the truths of the Christian life. This is the evidence that you're abiding in Christ, and that through your union with Christ, you have fellowship with the triune God. You are abiding in the truth. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. The result of this continual abiding, the end game, the product, the outcome, the eternal life that you receive, it's worth it. And why I say he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world because the behind this Gnostic teaching, behind these false gospels and these false teachings is a spiritual power at work seeking to deceive those, the God of this age, blinding the, the minds of unbelievers that they would not see Christ and come to faith in him. There's a spiritual power behind all this. And it can be frightening to realize that these antichrists that are out in this world, and even if you want to, uh, if, you, if you're convinced that there is a big antichrist figure that's going to come at the end of the age, it can be frightening to think about all these realities. And to think about those words that Jesus said, that, that, that there will be a time of, of such um, persuasion that if, if they could, even the elect would be deceived. How can we stand up against that spiritual power, how can we stand up against these false narratives and false gospels and, and false Jesuses that are out there in this world? How can we do that if we know and believe the truth that he who is in us, the spirit of Christ in us, is greater than he who is in the world? It's greater than he who is in the world. So make sure that your beliefs aren't only sincere, but they are true. 
Make sure that the belief that you have in Jesus is of the true Jesus. The one that has been revealed to us in Scripture. The one who has saved us because he is both God and man. Amen. We pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you. For this time that we could study your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I didn't give you much time there. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I could pray much longer because I'm losing my 